Hey everybody, Adam Savage here in my cave with a show and tell that's been a long time coming. I should have showed you this show and tell a long time ago. Now, over my shoulder you can see a Mercury helmet, my Mercury helmet. Here's me wearing that Mercury helmet on the floor at San Diego's Comic-Con a few years ago. Um, it is a beautiful reproduction of the original Mercury helmets. Uh, some of the pieces are incredibly accurate. Uh, it's very close fitting. Uh, and all that's germane to today's show and tell because what I wanted to show you is a go with, I guess is what you'd call it, for my Mercury helmet. And it is my Mercury cockpit. Yeah, today we're gonna talk about this beautiful, beautiful rendition of the Friendship 7 Mercury cockpit. There's a thing that I feel like I notice when I look at early American space program hardware. And it's that despite the marvelous sophistication of the construction, I really feel like I can see that this is the first time humans had tried something like this. Like you can feel the iterative nature of the artifacts from the early space program. And that's why I'm shooting close-ups of this helmet right now, but it's also why I love this Mercury cockpit so, so much. So this is a incredibly accurate depiction of John Glenn's Friendship 7 cockpit arrangement for the first American in orbit. <laughs> yeah. Um, this was his interface with the machine he took farther from Earth than any American had yet gone before. Uh, and it's incredible. Um, perhaps you can tell that I've dimmed the lights of my, uh, of my shop so that you can see the lights on the cockpit a little bit better. Um, in fact, uh, many of the switches actually function. Uh, yeah, I love this. Uh, and that, honestly, I mean, what have I done? I, I've decided to make the ultimate play set. But let me talk about the gestation of this. A couple summers ago, I was thinking to myself that, you know, when I have shop assistants working in the shop, like Freddie or Mel or Jen, um, that uh, as, a, as a, uh, a shop manager, I sometimes don't give them enough specific goals. I, I say, yeah, just work on this thing for a little bit. And I don't give like a deadline. And I, I was working on my book about deadlines and I was thinking I need to give them some deadlines. I need to give these wonderful folks the experience of having to turn in something impossible on the clock. And so uh, to Mel and Freddie, who were working at that time, uh, I said, I want to achieve a Friendship 7 cockpit in three weeks. Do what you, do what you can. Uh, 3D printing, laser cutting, I don't care how it gets done, but you've got three weeks. Now, that's a tall order. I fully, fully recognize that. Um, and uh, Freddie and Mel jumped into it with the great good humor and excellent work ethic that they both possess. Um, and I will say, I think uh, about midway in the project, Mel kind of absorbed it into their soul. Uh, not to say that Freddie wasn't, but you know, sometimes in every project, somebody kind of takes on the totality of that project and just em embraces it. That, that's definitely something true. Uh, and it's actually something I, I quoted Guillermo del Toro as saying, is like, you can't predict when a film will be successful, but every successful film has one, at least one person who is its ultimate champion. I will say that for this cockpit, Mel was its ultimate champion. And watching Mel take this thing to its completion in a month, uh, four weeks flat. And as a supervisor, I can tell you, holy cow, that is a... I know I gave a tight timeline for three weeks. A month is still an amazing achievement for this incredible piece. And it is all laser cut, all 3D printed. Um, they went and they found colors that matched the original. Every little bit and mark on this, from the little, what look like Sharpie marks and initials, to little pieces of paper and their size, 
is all exactly correct to the Friendship 7 cockpit. And we have all this information because NASA provided uh, blueprints, layouts of the cockpits and the instrument panels. Um, we have pictures of the real thing from the Smithsonian, which has this sitting in their foyer. Uh, and <clears throat> there's an aspect to this, like the helmet that feels so clearly like this is the first time we were doing something like this. Um, and I'm gonna shoot some close-ups to use as overlay as I talk about some of these things. Um, but first up, I just, I wanted you to, I'm gonna back this camera up a little bit um, and point out that like when you're sitting at this cockpit, let's see, when you're sitting at this cockpit, Sitting like right about here is about where John Glenn and the other Mercury astronauts sat. So here you are, you're in a capsule. Now, where is that capsule? Well, it's a cone that sits around you, right? Uh, it's a cone, right, it's a cone that sits around you like this. So that's the nose of your cone and the back is here. So picture yourself on the launch pad. You're lying on your back. Gravity's behind you, you're looking at space. Here is a window, and here is a window. And those describe the outside of your capsule, and right behind your back is hundreds of feet of rocket fuel. And there's a couple of things going on. One is like 10-year-old me is like, every 10-year-old of every stripe loves a good cockpit, they love, they love the adventure of an instrument panel where you can click switches and make things turn on and turn off, and yeah, that's thrilling. But then there's thinking about these early astronauts and thinking about them getting in this, what feel like such a homegrown, not jury-rigged, because every piece of this was, was workshopped and worked over and, and analyzed by incredible women and men in the NASA program making this all work but there's an aspect to it that feels so handmade. It, it really, it, it makes the experience of considering those astronauts and their journey really visceral. Uh, there's an eye chart here. There's a couple of eye charts because they didn't know what was gonna happen to the eyes of an astronaut when they left Earth's gravity well or extended the distance from Earth's gravity well, right? Like they didn't know these, th these were things they didn't know. That's thrilling. They, they were like every last aspect of this involved stuff that humans had never tried before. And so they accommodated for all of these different contingencies. Um, this right here, this is maybe my favorite instrument of any cockpit ever. This is the Earth Path Indicator and it was not used in uh, all the Mercury missions. It is effectively a little globe that turns, that shows you where you are over the Earth as you're traveling over the Earth. That is an analog Earth location instrument. Like, I would kill to have one of these in my car. And actually, to be honest, it wouldn't be that hard to build one for your car, right? Like, with Arduino and a little globe, you, you, you could probably do it using your GPS. Maybe that'll be a one day build that I'll do someday. But until then, I will satisfy myself with this magnificent thing that you could use to figure out your position over the earth. Um, as much as we could, every switch actually uh, is an actual mechanical switch. They don't all uh, affect lights on this cockpit, but many of them do. Uh, and it is really fun to sit people down at this beautiful object and get that visceral experience. Yeah, man, I mean, just, just imagine how, how intense that must have been. Yeah, my hat is off to, to the entire program. Uh, careful viewers might note that I have not included needles in the dials. That is because I hold out the hope that someday I may add a servo needle, servo driven needle for every dial and that means that we could turn this into a flight simulator. <laughs> um, every act for me, every act of replication is an act of physicalizing a narrative. 
Uh, and to a certain extent, sure, making this cockpit and sitting at it physicalizes an astronaut's narrative to me, um, but also the act of putting this together according to the original plans physicalizes the, the narrative of the incredible engineers and technicians and physicists, the thousands and thousands of men and women at NASA whose work led to this and led to everything subsequently and even led to uh, SpaceX getting two astronauts on the ISS a few weeks ago. Uh, there's a way in which seeing this and being able to touch it feels like it puts me in touch with that, the entirety of that engineering project. Not, not like I understand the whole thing, no, 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 but, but I can start to glimpse that whole landscape that was going on. The hope, the, uh, the Cold War, to be clear, you know, there's political ramifications in the Cold War and the race to space against the Russians and all of that. But when you break it all down to its most constituent components, this is the work of tens or hundreds of thousands of people, each fulfilling their part of a greater whole to do something remarkable. That's what I feel every time I see this. This sits uh, close to the front door of my shop. I see it every day when I come on in. And I, I, you know, I, I hope to take this out so that other people can sit in it. Once the world starts up again, uh, I love the idea of Having a uh, having a little more of of this cockpit be able to be experienced by by others. Um, it also was a delight seeing uh, watching Freddie and Mel put this together, and really specifically watching Mel kind of unlock something in themselves to finish this, because Mel became a sort of a fever dream of completion, uh, and. It was exactly what I was kind of hoping for from the original ask, the original task, the deadline. Uh, yeah, this, this is a stunning piece and I'm so proud to be its steward at this moment in time. It won't always be with me in my cave. At some point it may live somewhere else. That's another thing that I love, right? Like making something like this and realizing that it might outlast me. It might end up having a very strange future. I don't know. Uh, thank you guys for joining me for this show and tell of my Mercury Friendship 7 cockpit replica. <laughs>